There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. It's a brand new week and you're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Mr. Tim Dennis at the Supernatural News Desk. It's a Supernatural News Monday and Parashare. We've got some of your stories to share a little later on in the show. All right, Tim, it's been a busy weekend. A lot of weird things going on in the world around us. AI trying to kill us. We know that now. AI wanting to have babies. That's a little disturbing. I'm sure you've been sent that story about a thousand times as well, correct? I was sent the most disturbing AI story that I don't even think I can read it on air. Oh, really? That sounds like a bit of a challenge. Let's hold it till a little bit later on then. Uh, Let's get started. Where are we going to begin in the world of supernatural news today? Well, Dave, we all like to enjoy a good vacation away from work, but evidently this paranormal investigator could not get away from ghosts. Oh, okay. Uh, his 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 uh, holiday his his mm-hmm. his nice little vacation was interrupted by a ghost he caught on camera. So he's a paranormal investigator. He's out on vacation, and bam, happens to capture a ghost again, yep. even though he's not looking for one. Not even looking for it. But interesting. But caught it nonetheless. All uh, right. What happened? Well, it turns out that um, a paranormal investigator had his uh, holiday interrupted by a ghoul he caught on camera appearing to carry a lantern uh, walking through a wall. He had, met, he had a few things going on there. Uh, Tony Ferguson had been enjoying a trip to Nottingham uh, with a friend when the pair visited the 500 caverns in the city of caves that lie below the shopping center. After spotting a ghostly figure, Tony began filming to see what he could pick up and was left terrified when he picked up what he claims was a full apparition in 1800 period dress moving through the darkness. Footage shows a light appearing to float in the darkness before a full figure emerges and appears to pass right through the wall of the caves, which dates back to at least 900 AD, but possibly even older. Wow. Uh, The 32-year-old ghost hunter from Southampton uh, said, What is so amazing is that I was only there on my holidays. I was just exploring like any other tourist would, really. I wasn't really expecting to capture anything at all. The ghost was carrying a lantern of some kind, and his clothes are not from our time. They looked like they were from the 1800s. A lot of people picked up on this when they watched the video. There would not have been much light down there hundreds of years ago, and they would have needed to carry candles or lanterns. Uh, Back then, there would not have been lighting like there is now, so that explains why the figure is carrying a lantern, he went on to say. Uh, I actually saw it earlier in the night. I picked it up, and I could see it staring at me. I carried on talking, and it disappeared. We walked on, and a figure appeared in front of us and walked right through the wall. Uh, You can hear it go through the wall. It made a whooshing sound. I don't know what it could be, some kind of energy from it, perhaps. After I saw it, I checked the camera and realized it had picked the figure up too, thank God. I was shocked. I had to look back lots of times to check to see that no one was there, but there was no way anyone was there. And there was no way someone could walk through a wall unless they had some sort of special powers that I don't know about, he went on to add. It was a full apparition. Uh, People have been saying it was an amazing capture. I'm over the moon to have caught it. Uh, It is thought to be or it is thought the oldest areas of the caves, rather, could date back to the 4th century where people dug into the soft sandstone to create somewhere cozy to sleep, but before people uh, or before people eventually began living down there, 
Uh, eventually, the caves were used for an array of uses, including cesspits, tanneries, slum housing, air raid shelters, and hideouts for murderers, thieves, and other criminals. So really, it was like a retirement community, Dave. <laughs> It sounds like it. Uh, And it wasn't even in Florida. No, no, it wasn't even close. Uh, Since Tony visited in the late afternoon, he claims he and his friends uh, had run of the place to themselves and is convinced that no one else was there when he filmed the encounter. Tony said uh, they are well known for being haunted and there was lots of activity. It is one of the weirdest places I have ever investigated as you enter these very dark caves through the shopping center. Uh, The outside was very misleading. Uh, We had the whole place to ourselves, and there was absolutely no one else there. People are saying I could be the only paranormal investigator to have captured two full apparitions so clearly like this. It takes a lot of luck. It was the luck of the draw that I was in the right time and place to capture it. The ghost had no awareness that I was there. Uh, The figure didn't acknowledge me. For me, it's like it's in its own time doing its own thing. It's what people call a residual haunting. I thought it must be have been a person, but then I checked and realized me and my friend were the only ones there. That's when I got scared. It was unsettling to realize that it was real. It was a personal experience of mine, but the camera validates what I saw. Uh, to have it on camera makes it all complete. There are definitely haunted caves, he went on to add. I have found a few things in my research after seeing it. Lots of people have seen things or experienced things down there, apparently. It has a different feel to the place. There are many spirits there, so you get a different sense in different areas of the caves. Of the 500 or so known caves, it is thought only around 76 have been recently investigated or recorded in any detail. Many were inhabited by the poor for hundreds of years until the practice of renting out cellars and caves as homes was banned in 1845, though could well have continued beyond that date. There you go. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Where are we going to go next? Uh, Next, we continue on. And uh, this having to do with uh, huge mystery lights shining hundreds of feet into the sky above Fastlane Nuclear Submarine Base. Ooh, this one is is kind of... Ooh, that doesn't sound good. (laughs) No, you never... Whenever you say nuclear sub and base and mistaken identity, uh, it never goes off well. And and beams of light emanating from the nuclear base? Right. That doesn't sound good either. Right. I don't don't think they're doing like a big dance club opening there. No, although that would be cool to have a rave there, but yeah, it... it, uh, it, Mm. Even that could go wrong. Yeah. No, no muy bueno. Yeah, exactly what you said, with guacamole on top. Uh, A bizarre white White light was captured shining into the sky above a Scott's nuclear sub base. The mystery UFO was spotted early, eerily, or early too. It was it was early in the morning. Uh, eerily floating above. Is it? You tell me, Dave. Is it Garlock or Garlock? Yes. Okay. You at, are correct. Uh, it is definitely great. one of those. You go ahead and email me. I won't read it at uh, <laughs> Fastlane Naval Base in in uh, Helensburg. Uh, the, uh, bewildered man was over three miles away across the water in Greenock, uh, when he spotted the unidentified glow at around 10 30 PM on Saturday. He told the Scottish sun it was Saturday at around half 10. When I saw it, I thought it was strange when I saw two bright white lights in the sky, and then they kind of merged into one. The footage was taken about three miles away. It just appeared above fast lane. Uh, I was on Greenock Esplanade when I took the video I noticed it straight away and knew and knew straight away it was above fast lane I don't want to say it was an alien or UFO or something but it was just very bizarre it looks like the light is a, about a couple hundred feet in the air uh, it was really bright as well and so my reaction was to get my phone out and video it paranormal investigator Malcolm Robinson originally from Oh, my. Aloha Clackmanisher, I believe is how you say it, uh, said such strange encounters are often linked to nuclear bases like Fastlane. Uh, He told the Scottish Sun, in my records, there are a number of UFO reports at Fastlane over uh, the years, many in relation to strange lights. This gentleman does not stand alone with what he witnessed at the naval base. It's definitely an intriguing video. The founder of Strange Phenomena Investigations, who's 60, added, It's not just naval bases in the UK and Europe. There have been UFO sightings at Army bases around the world. It might sound a bit 
uh, like Hollywood, but it makes sense that the Army bases are keeping an eye on special advancements. But Malcolm, who has published five UFO books, said there could be uh, many natural explanations for the spooky clip. He said there are so many things that can be misconstrued when looking at possible UFO sightings. Chinese lanterns, oh, that old Chinese lanterns excuse, Dave, uh, were a real problem five to ten years ago. Now it's small drones with lights on them, which can often be misconstrued as UFOs. Nick Pope, who used to run the British government's UFO project at the uh, Ministry of Defense, said the video raised concerns. He said whatever people believe about UFOs having something unidentified over fast lane is a security issue. Any such sighting over a military base is automatically of defense interest. But because the MOD axed its UFO project in 2009, there's no longer a focal point for looking at this sort of thing. Some of the most intriguing UFO incidents on file have occurred over military bases. And while it's a sensitive issue, there does some, seem to be a particular connection between UFOs and nuclear facilities where there are usually no fly zones in place. The MOD should launch an immediate inquiry, Pope went on to say. The Ministry of Defense has been approached for comment. Keen alien hunters can join Malcolm at next year's Scottish UFO and Paranormal Conference, which is being held at Aberte University in Dundee on July Look to 28th. the skies, laddie. I see some UFOs up there. <laughs> Do you think that's the way it's going to play out in Scotland? I think that's pretty much what the entire conference will be. Yeah, it'll just be a lot of that. Bah, that's nothing but the northern lights, you moron. Ah, screw you, McCamish. You don't know what you're speaking about. <laughs> I think it'll be a lot of that. Actually, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be Mick a, Hamish a Scottish name. I don't know. I just kind of came up with Mick. Yeah, Hamish. I think it's an old family name. Actually, I remember seeing the crest, if I remember right, of Mick Hamish. <laughs> yes, the Mick Hamish clan. Yes, the Mick Hamish clan of the. There was uh, a guy in a guy in a lazy uh, lazy boy recliner <laughs> with a ha- half drank Guinness, I think, in one hand and a lazy eye in in the socket. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, McCamish. He was uh I remember him well. We used to golf mm-hmm. together. Yeah. Yeah. All right, where are we going next? <laughs> well, a medium says she has helped 100 ghosts cross over. Tim tries not to roll his eyes uh until they roll back in his skull hundreds of times. Um yeah. I always get a little skeptical about these stories. Dave, but let's go on. Uh mm-hmm. K K Blecka is trained in occupational therapy. Bless play- you. Uh, thank you. Kibleka. Um but bless you. Bless you. Uh, thank you. Kibleka. Uh is, bless you. Bless is you. thank you. My God, thank get you. that looked into. I should, yeah. It's it's allergy season. It's the the tail end of it, Dave. Uh is uh, trained in occupational therapy, plays viola with the uh or viola. Viola was a pitcher for the twins. Uh, plays viola with the Quincy Symphony Orchestra and says she can speak to the dead. Uh, Blacha uh, is 59 oh, bless years old. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, 59 years old and a regular at the pier. And the self proclaimed medium says the restaurant has a ghost. Uh, the eatery's owners are uncertain, but both Richard and Kelly Cole concede that some weird things happen there. Wearing a Ghostbusters pin on her lapel, of course she does. Uh, Blecka shuffles into the restaurant with her arms full of pictures, documents, and a Bible. And why not? Uh, for her, ghosts and religion go hand in hand. Placa is uh, prepared. Well, bless you. Bless thank you. you. Thank you. I, mm-hmm. I, I should have tissue around here somewhere. Uh, is prepared for an interview and a paranormal encounter. The pier is on the river, she said. There's lots of energy with the river and all the boat traffic. Uh, revealing three sets of copper dowsing rods. Uh, one shaped or I sh- Is that eye shaped or one shape? Eye shaped tools, paranormal researchers believe... Uh, can move independently in the presence of a ghost. Blecka uh, calls or begins calling out for spirits. The rod in her left hand, which is meant to indicate the presence of a female spirit, shifts sharply towards her chest. Huh? <laughs> the ghosts are having a little fun there. Uh, Hi, Mom, she said. Really? Her mom's pointing a rod towards her chest? Uh, adding that although her mother died in 2008, she had been appearing more frequently at Blecka's paranormal endeavors. Uh, well, bless you, by the way. Th- thank you. Uh, Blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, begins. Well, bless you. Ad- thank you. Uh, begins addressing a male spirit she has detected and quickly rattles off several questions. Moments later, the event is over as she sets her rods down uh, on a nearby table. She says the spirit is crossed over. It's like magic. It's an illusion, like uh, uh, what's his name used to say. 
Uh, it's the third time. It's a magic joke. It's a very dated magic joke, Dave. Um, it's the third time she says she's cleared the pier in the last year and a half, Dave, and she plans to do it again. She just she's like the uh, exterminator that can never get his job right. She keeps clearing the pier, and and by gosh, it comes back. Uh, always in pesky, the, the pesky ghosts, they keep coming back. I mean, when you've got uh, snack food left around, like they do, you know, people with their chips and their yeah. dips and such well, on the pier, people go, what's going to keep a ghost from coming back? They're like seagulls. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it's coming back for the chips. Uh, always an intuitive mm-hmm. kid growing up in Grand Forks, North, North Dakota, uh, pardon me, uh, said she used to know who was at the door or calling on the phone. Other family members had similar skills. Her mother seemed to have the uncanny ability to predict who would die next, and her sister can help find lost objects. Well, who needs the metal detector then? Uh, At nine, she started playing the viola and the violin and now plays with the Quincy Symphony Orchestra and Muddy River Opera Company. The daughter of a physical therapist and a German teacher, she only had a few friends growing up. (laughs) <laughs> Go figure. Uh, with curly hair, glasses, and braces, being an outcast as a child has given her a sort of fearlessness in adulthood. Uh, she's been called weird before. Imagine that, Dave. Uh, anytime you're different, it will be pointed out to you, she said. I made the best use of my time reading books and developing the skills that people are jealous of now, like crossing people over and over and over and over again. A music education major in college, she sang in clubs, toured with rock and pop bands, and spent a couple of months as a USO girl in the South Pacific. I was 24, she said, producing a black and white photograph of herself on stage during a USO show. A near-death experience at 28, during which she suffered an asthma attack and was hospitalized, produced a surreal experience. She said she had a life review. Once your life flashes before your eyes, and then she met an angel. And it wasn't Dave, no. Uh, The angel asked (laughs) if I wanted to come with them, and I decided to live, she said. The intuition grew from there about 12 years ago while helping with tours at Rock Cliff Mansion in Hannibal, Missouri. She tapped into her paranormal abilities. Citing uh, 1 Corinthians 12, she came uh, to believe that the ability was a spiritual gift, Dave. Uh, Uh, Yes, 1 Corinthians 12. I believe that's, uh, thou shalt not go swimming, for thirty minutes after Edith, a sandwicheth. Yes, if it I is. remember correctly, yes, I could. Is. I yeah. might be off a chapter or two, but I no. think that's it no. in a nutshell. I think you got it. I think your Sunday mm-hmm. school is coming in handy here. Mm-hmm. Or it's either that or whistleth while you worketh. I think that well, might be the. Maybe mm. that's it. I can't remember. They're so close to each other in they, the book of the Bible. They are. They really mm-hmm. are. Uh, helping ghosts cross is why I think I live. She said as she held out an orange flag at an intersection. I'm kidding. I made that last part up. I see see what you uh, tried to do there. Uh, There's a big difference between mediums and psychics, she explained. All mediums are psychics, but not all psychics are mediums. See what she did there? Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. Psychics observe, mediums converse, she said. Hmm. Uh, She said she has helped about 100 ghosts cross over in the years since and always tries to bring witnesses when doing so because you know everybody can see that stuff uh blacka uh said ghosts appear primarily thank you uh appear primarily because they want help adding that emotional baggage often anger guilt or shame is a common reason for someone's spirit to stay behind she has a running list of restaurants businesses and condemned buildings in the area that she plans to investigate One of the restaurants, she believes, houses the spirit of a runaway slave who had escaped through the Underground Railroad. I have to be clinical, she said, while describing an experience in which she helped three adults and three children cross over in one outing. I might start to cry, but I have to fight it, she went on to say. Blecha uh, pursued her graduate degree in occupational therapy from the University of Buffalo 25 years ago. She used to work in geriatrics and saw death regularly. She would offer advice and encouragement to those who were dying. It was like, go, do it, die, do it, die. No, I'm kidding. She didn't do that. Uh, Healthcare and ghosts, she said. I approach them in the same way, like a waitress approaches her table. (laughs) That's a bad way to approach it. Mm -hmm. especially if you're not bringing the drinks right away because people get pissed off. On the spectrum from believer to skeptic, the coals fall somewhere in the middle. They aren't quick to accept the many occurrences at their restaurant as paranormal activity, but they also aren't inclined to dismiss the possibility. I'm on the fence, Richard Cole said, but after you have the chance to witness it, you start to wonder. 
They've seen men walking through the river and entering a sewer drain in the middle of the day. Kelly Cole has a grainy picture from that day that appears to back up the story. Wine bottles and dishes randomly crashing to the floor when no one else is around and odd problems with the elevator. Blecka said she recently helped a ghost named Gabriella cross over. The next ghost she plans to interact with at the pier is named Brian. I definitely don't know, Kelly Cole said, but there are many strange things that have happened that you have trouble explaining away. There you be. Speaking of the paranormal, Tim, yeah. I, I'm pretty excited. I'm part of a program on Footprint.tv. We're part of the Dark Zone, and there's a new series on there. Um, I think people are going to like it. It's called Is It Real? And there are these micro episodes. They're anywhere from about 5 to 12 minutes long. And we look at some of the most um, interesting pieces of reported paranormal phenomena. Hmm. It's myself, Carl Pfeiffer, uh, Susan Slaughter. Those are uh, two of the winners from the uh, Ghost Hunters Academy TV series. We've got Jay Vanderberg. We've got uh, um, Patrick Doyle and Kristen Lumen from the Ghost Mind TV series that are a part of it as well. It's it's really a neat little setup, and we all take a look at it from different perspectives at these pieces of evidence to try to break it down and understand what it is that we're looking at. Is it real? And you can find new episodes every week by checking out footprint.tv. You'll see the Dark Zone banner there. Click on that. Or you can just go straight to darknessradio.com, scroll down a bit, and you'll see the Is It Real banner. Click on that. It'll give you the easiest access to check out the episodes and never miss a minute of it. I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's a cool little series. We're about four episodes in right now, and uh, there's some really interesting bits of evidence that have been turned into us. And if you have some compelling video evidence or photographic evidence that you'd like us to review, you can always email it to me with your contact information at dave at darknessradio.com to be considered for a future episode. All right, where are we going next in the world of supernatural news, Tim? We will move on to DNA evidence, Dave. There's uh, DNA evidence out there uh, that shows that Yeti was a local Himalayan bear all along. Really? Yeah. All right, next story. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there's more oh, to oh, it. Oh, I mean, you oh know, there's more to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, that kind yeah. Of, yeah, that's like telling you when you open up the book that the the... That the butler did it. I mean, that was already right there, right in your face. DNA evidence that the Yeti is a bear. Okay. Well, but there's there's a little intrigue to it. A host of DNA samples strongly suggest that Yetis are, in fact, local Himalayan bears. So watch out, Bigfoot. There you go. Uh, An international team of researchers took a look at bear and supposed Yeti DNA samples to better pinpoint the origin of the mythological creature. Uh, The researchers' results imply that Yetis were hardly paranormal or even strange, but the results also help paint a better picture of the bears living in the Himalayas. Even if we didn't discover a strange new hybrid species of bear or some ape-like creature, it was exciting that it gave the opportunity to learn more about bears in the region, as they are rare and little genetic data that has been published previously, said study author Charlotte Lindquist, a biology professor from the University of Buffalo in New York. The Yeti or Abominable Snowman is a sort of wild ape-like hominid uh, that's the subject of long-standing Himalayan mythology. Scientists have questioned prior research suggesting that purported Yeti hair samples came from a strange polar bear hybrid or a new species. Uh, The analysis did rule out the possibility that the samples belonged to brown bear, according to the paper published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Lindquist and her team analyzed DNA from 24 different bear or purported Yeti samples from the wild in museums, including uh, feces, hair, skin, and bone. They were definitely all bears, and the Yeti samples seemed to match up well with exiting uh, Himalayan brown bears. The study represents the most rigor- rigorous analysis to date of the samples suspected to derive from anomalous or mythical hominid-like creatures The paper concludes, strongly suggesting the biological basis of the Yeti legend as local brown and black bears. There you go. I know it. I know it. I I tried not to make it anticlimactic, but that's still pretty encouraging, though. Don't you think? I guess. (laughs) All right. Uh, Well, it's just disappointing. Yeah, I just want it to be a damn Yeti. Why does it always have to be a bear? Shaggy ass bastards up there pretending to be a Bigfoot. Well, here, I'll come back with something a little more exciting about Bigfoot. Ooh. Okay? All right. What have you got for a, me? A woman has reported a Bigfoot sighting out on I 80. How's that, huh? Mm, got yeah. it. Oh, wow. I, I, wait, I 80, where though? Uh, near North Platte in Colorado. Oh. Mm. 
No good. No close to me. No close to you? <laughs> that was very primal of you. Uh, no, no close to no me. No close to me. I'm very very Frankenstein of me, don't you think? It is, yeah, yeah. A uh, Bigfoot sighting was reported Saturday night on Interstate 80 near North Platte. Harriet McFeely, no relation to Mr. McFeely, of uh, Hastings. Delivery. <laughs> uh, wow, said, that's a random, uh, random mention. That's from uh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. For for those of you old enough to remember, and for those of you too young to care, sorry for wasting that last thirty five seconds. Yeah. Next, there you go. Uh, said she and her friend Robin Roberts, uh, not of ESPN fame, uh, of Colorado, were driving back from Omaha on Saturday. I'm just making up my own news story here. Uh, McFeely said Roberts dropped her off in Hastings and went on her way. A little while later, McFeely said Roberts called her and was excited. Roberts told McFeely she saw or just saw a Bigfoot. She said, I just saw a Bigfoot. He was standing right here on the shoulder of the road, McFeely said. Roberts was at mile marker 197, not far from North Platte, around 9 p.m. when she saw the Bigfoot. She said he was really big. He was really heavy and stocky, McFeely said. I hope she didn't say that in front of him, Dave. That could hurt his feelings. I mean, I'm just thinking. Yeah, I mean, you'd think people would have a little bit more courtesy, but right. we know for a fact they don't, so no, go on. They, do, they really don't, no. They're, they're no oh, no you're Darkness Radio Dave. Hmm, your voice doesn't match the way you look. I thought you'd be much better looking and not so fat. Yeah. I yeah. get that. I've had people actually oh, I, tell me that at my table. Tell me about it. Yeah, I get it, too. Uh, the Bigfoot yeah. was said to oh, be— people tell you that I'm, I'm a lot fatter than they thought I was going to well, be? That's really cruel. I wasn't going to say anything, but they do. Mm. Uh, the Bigfoot was said to be standing inside the fence, meant to kept, uh, keep deer away from the road, only a about 20 feet from Robert's car, McFeely said Roberts told her the Bigfoot was at least eight feet tall. Right at that time, there wasn't a lot for, or there wasn't a lot of cars going either way right there. Uh, that's why she saw him so clearly, McFeely said. McFeely called the Nebraska State Patrol to report the sighting. And there you go. And what did they say? Did they, uh, you know, when you call the State Patrol... I'm just curious. Are they okay, ma'am? All right. Oh, and uh, was he driving a vehicle? There's a little oh, bit really? more. To, there's there's more to the story. Oh gosh, I, uh-huh. I skipped over okay. this. Uh, Go. Uh, uh, McFeely said, "I said, is this considered an official sighting of a Bigfoot?" Um, and uh, they said, "Definitely." Wow. Okay. Uh, she said Roberts saw that the north channel of the Platte River was near where she saw the Bigfoot. Uh, McFeely said she's always known Bigfoot to travel along the rivers because, you know, they <laughs> they evidently are, are, I don't know, need water, I guess. Uh, Take me to the river. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Wash me in the water. She said, Bigfoot singing as he's scrubbing up in the. Well, I tried yeah, to stay yeah. away from Rolf the dog voice. Thank you. And I, I think I, I think I gave it his own unique flavoring there. You, you it was did. kind of like a cross between Rolf and and Goofy. He had a little soul there, and I appreciate. That. Take me to the river. Uh, she said she's never seen a Bigfoot in Nebraska, but uh, she has friends that have. Uh, seen them near Grand Island, Bellevue, Lincoln, and Macy in Nebraska. Uh, the Nebraska State Patrol responded, but posted on their Facebook page on Sunday that there was uh, no Bigfoot to be found. So evidently, they're Bigfoot deniers. And that's the rest of the story there. And that's the rest of the story. And that's the rest of the story. All right, where are we going next, sir? Uh, finally, because this is the last one, because, uh, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. that Under Armour mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um some men have been hospitalized after a bizarre sorcery ritual, Dave. And it is a bizarre one indeed. Uh, seven Indonesians, we go to Jakarta, were hospitalized after rinsing their hands in acid, police said mm. yesterday, as they hunted for the self-styled sorcerer who promised the men it would make them invincible. Mm-hmm. The bizarre ritual last week left the men, residents of the Rawakopi village, uh, just outside the capital of Jakarta, with serious burns on their hands, this according to authorities. A, ma- a mystery man named Didi, not Dido, but Didi, uh, w- who moved into the village several months ago, claimed he was the master of traditional magic known as Debus, uh, which is supposed to protect a person from physical injury. The self- Debus? Isn't it the uh, godson, Debus? No, no, that's that's Jeebus, Dave, not Debus. Oh, Jeebus. I don't know Jeebus. Yeah. Uh, Jeebus is just all right with me, though, Dave. He's do 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 do
key and off beat that we can't get sued for using that part of the song? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, Excellent. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, so- In your face, famous people. <laughs> That's right. The self-proclaimed magician offered free lessons and promised to make the unlucky men invincible. Well, (laughs) you can't turn down free, can you? Mm -mm. Or Uh, invincibility. Right. Uh, These men were trying to become invincible with a man who claimed to be a guru, local police chief Harry Kurniawan. There you go. uh, Told AFP yesterday to test that promise, Didi. Uh, suggested that the men rinse their hands in a chemical that police believe was acid. It was not long before the men were rushed to the hospital with severe burns. And there you go. So there you Ouch. go. If a man says, you're now invincible, Sim Sullivan, go ahead, wash your hands in acid. It's probably Yeah, don't believe him. Yeah, probably a good idea not to do that. Hey, can I make a quick uh, public service announcement? Sure. I've gotten emails from numerous people regarding the Mandela effect, Tim. Oh, boy. And... Yeah. You wouldn't believe this, but they pointed their source to, of all places, SpongeBob. Okay. And also to other hit TV series. All right. Now, I'm going to throw out to you what they've witnessed, and let's see if you know. I am curious if you're familiar with why this would appear to be a Mandela effect. People that are addicted to TV, watching TV shows, they remember when they first came on, they enjoyed watching them, and now in subsequent reruns, they're revisiting these shows and there are scenes that they have not seen before as part of these episodes, Tim. Is this the Mandela effect, or is there another answer? <laughs> What's your answer, Tim? Do you believe it might be Mandela? That they're remembering scenes in cartoons that, or, or they're seeing scenes in cartoons that never existed before? Or do you think there's another answer for how this is happening? It's another answer, Dave. If they're watching SpongeBob, the weed's finally wearing off. and they've Yeah, finally, there's that. Yeah, they're finally remembering what's happening in the cartoons. Yeah, they've, they've stopped looking at the slices of pizza long enough to uh, realize right. that something else is moving on. No, yeah. here's something. And I've gotten quite a few emails regarding SpongeBob and some of the other popular TV shows out there. When they're going back and watching them binging on them on netflix and other shows you know that that you can see the entire episode Mm -hmm. here's what happens when they film an episode they may film a 24 minute episode to fit in a 30 minute time slot okay okay Mm -hmm. that's what the idea that they're going to sell around six minutes worth of commercial ads well if the show takes off and advertisers start lining up they have to trim pieces of the episode which will often you know cut it down by a minute or sometimes up to two minutes per episode And then in subsequent replays, when advertising is down, because, you know, a lot of these guys, they want to be in on the first run episodes. Okay. And they're really advertising heavy in those. And then as it plays out and what SpongeBob has been around since 1903, I think now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, You know, it it starts to wear thin and the advertisers start backing out their, their advertising dollars. And that means that they start, they need to fill that gap, that, that 24 minute gap again. So they start adding back in the original scenes that they deleted in the initial run. So when you're watching the unedited versions on things like Netflix or you're watching reruns on TV and you clearly remember this episode from top to bottom and there's a scene that you don't recall being a part of it, that's most likely what took place. And that's the more you know. It's a little public service announcement from me to the Mandela believers, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. You like that? I like that. Yeah. It's all about education. That's what we're all about on this show, Tim. We want to help people. We want to help people so bad that I'm going to tell you all something right now. You need to shut up. Stop doing what you're doing. If you're driving, (laughs) slam on the brakes and just listen to me right now. (laughs) What? Well, no, I just uh, the other thing that that kind of got me this last week, and it got really got under my skin a little bit. Well, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But as I'm in the middle of, of telling them some very important information, Tim, mm-hmm. right? This this is very important. All right. So stop what you put down the weed, turn off or, or mute SpongeBob, slam on the brakes, pull over to the side of the road and listen. Because Tim and I are your friends. We care about you and we want to bring you the best of the best. Beyond darkness.
We're back. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. And if you like the best in paranormal talk radio, you're going to love the best in true crime talk radio. Join Tim and I every Tuesday as we examine some of the most bizarre and unusual cases in true crime history with some of the most impressive guests, survivors, some of your most favorite TV personalities from true crime television shows. We've got uh, researchers. We've got journalists. You name it, we've got it. They're showing up on our show every Tuesday. And we've got great shows lined up for you. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, M. William Phelps is with us to talk about his book, Targeted, which is a really twisted story, Tim. This this deputy who... <laughs> You know, was she having affairs? Was there a murder involved? Is she innocent and being railroaded? Or is she as guilty as she appears to be? The evidence starts to mount against this woman. And M. William Phelps, Phelps looks into the case and begins to question just what he's looking at. Because it does seem too perfect. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. Plus, we've got some dumb crime, stupid criminals, and a couple of I Know a Murderer stories. And we'll do that tomorrow on True Crime Tuesday. How's that sound? Very cool. Here's how you can sign up for it. Go to darknessradio.com, click on the True Crime Tuesday banner, and you can find the link right there. It's only $5 a month. See, my bird's excited about it. $5 a month, and that'll get you in. You can subscribe and never miss another minute in the best of True Crime Talk Radio. And here's the cool part. There's no contracts. There's no lengthy commitments. You can sign up month by month, and it's only $5. Gives you four brand new episodes a month, sometimes five when there's that extra Tuesday wiggling in there. Plus, it gives you access to all of the past archives of the show. So give it a try. Check it out for only $5. It will be the best $5 you spend this month, guaranteed. So check that out for yourself. Put away that latte. Put away the Happy Meal this month and treat yourself to a real honor get yourself a little bit of true crime tuesday find it at darknessradio.com click on that true crime tuesday banner all right so we were kind of talking uh, about the mandela effect and i wanted to do that public service announcement because i've heard so many different people talk to me about the tv shows uh-huh. and remember not remembering specific scenes that are appearing in these reruns or in these unedited episodes that they're seeing on things like netflix right you have uh you have kind of a I don't know what a bone to pick. You've got an issue to chat about. What's going on? Uh, okay, here's the deal, Dave. Here, I, I am tired. I am sick and tired. Or as Tony Soprano would say, I am sick and tired of uh, of people using the Mandela effect as an excuse to be lazy about what's going on in the world around them. Here's the deal, folks. Because Jim Neighbors died... That does not mean it's an excuse for you to say, oh, I thought he died years ago. It must be the Mandela effect. No. No. Pay attention to the world around you. Wow. Jim Neighbors has been around. He's been in the news. Mm -hmm. He's been in the news. Shazam, shazam, shazam. He's released albums. Yeah. He's been out there. Yeah, unfortunately. He's been out there. He's he's actually made appearance on news programs, believe it or not. Uh, He's been out there. There's no crazy timeline where he he died of something because he didn't. He's been out there. I thought I remembered him dying. No, of, uh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. well, how about that time? I thought he no. committed. No, 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 no. Well, I thought he was shooting heroin up no. in a bathroom. No, that wasn't no. Jim Neighbors. No. OK, no, hmm. no. Been alive. What, isn't it? Uh, wasn't it AIDS no. at some point? No, I, no. I'm, I'm in all seriousness. Wasn't there a rumor for a while that Jim Neighbors had died of AIDS? No. Do you remember that? No. It turned out not to be true, but I, I, I could have sworn that that was part of the story. He had way. he had hepatitis B. And you know how he got hepatitis B? Oh, I know. I know. Aunt B's cooking. Yes. He got some Aunt B, hence the hepatitis B. She was a dirty, dirty wench. <laughs> um, no, what had happened was, this is actually pretty interesting. This was in the article, the, the real article, not the imaginary timeline article that everyone seems to think of. Um, but in the real article, when this? he... When he passed, it said that he had gotten this. This almost sounds like an excuse. He had gotten hepatitis B from a straight right or straight razor he had purchased while in India that he had shaved with. He had nicked himself, and that's how he contracted hepatitis B. What? That what? Yeah. What? He, yes. 
So it's not a real fast acting killer, though. He was like 87. No, what had happened was uh, his husband had said that he had he had nicked himself with the razor. It had the hepatitis B had had taken down his autoimmune system down to nothing. And he had been getting sick, steadily sick over the last 10 years to the point where he just couldn't fend off any illness anymore. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. And that's uh, essentially he succumbed to illness. Do you, do you remember when he died a bunch of years ago um, when that uh, asteroid smashed into him? No, I don't remember that. It, and there was that time he was eaten by the Loch Ness Monster? Uh, no, no, never happened. Yep. No. And that Barney Fife accidentally shot him I in do, the kidneys. I do remember that one. Yeah. 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 All right. Are, do you feel better getting that rant off your chest? A little, a little bit. angry about Jim Neighbors. Uh, well, it's just, you Why know. is that the guy that pisses you off? Well, I, every time a celebrity dies, I get emails about, didn't this guy die already? Well, obviously not. But uh, Or maybe in another world, another no. re- reality no. but i don't know no. this one's just really bending you it is because the guy's been you need around to hug? No, well, no i'm, I'm good sure. no i'm good well how do you know he's been around because i keep seeing him on the news i get every scary what are you watching old people news no just uh, you know the regular Speak news channel news. jim neighbors is in the headlines again oh, you work at a news station they make you watch news oh all you watch time. wrestling all the time how is jim neighbors and wrestling even a thing don't ask, don't tell, Dave. This week on WWE is brought to you by Jim Neighbors' Christmas album. No? Maybe. Maybe? <laughs> Maybe. All right, let's get some parish air rolling. Hey, guys, I thought I'd share with you what happened to my sister and I the weekend after Thanksgiving. My family and I spent a couple of days in D.C., and after dinner one night at around 11, we went around and saw the monuments and some of the sites We stopped at the Vietnam Memorial and somberly walked along the wall, silently looking at the names. Everyone in my family had gotten at least 20 feet ahead of my sister and me when the two of us were towards the middle of the wall, where it's tallest. We heard someone very distinctly come up behind us and their footsteps stopping to stand and look at the wall over our shoulder. We could somewhat see an outline of someone but nothing specific. We just assumed my husband had been behind us and thought he had come up to stand. We stood there for maybe 10 seconds longer while looking at the wall and were both ready to move. Silently, we looked behind us to see if my husband was ready to move as well. When we turned around, there was no one there. There was no one in sight, and everyone in our group was still way ahead of us, and we definitely didn't hear anyone walk away after we heard the footsteps walking up to us. When we realized no one was there, we just kind of looked at each other, shocked. Then we realized, without a doubt, we had both experienced the exact same thing. We both had incredible chills and walked up to meet the group and waited to discuss the incident until later. We both heard and felt the presence and had the exact same memory. So I'm apt to believe that someone was behind us and that I wasn't just imagining things. Anyway, thank for, thanks for taking the time to read this. Sorry about the lack of indentations. I'm using my phone because uh, I'm too lazy to get off and get my laptop. Keep up the good work. And that comes from Brennan. Thank you, Brennan. We appreciate the study a lot. And if you've got a story, feel free to send them in to Dave at darknessradio.com. We always love to hear your stories. We'll share them here on the air. Especially if they're well written with punctuation, Tim. Punctuation. Right. Yeah. Dentation. Yeah. Hey, Dave and Tim. My brother in law introduced me to your podcast, and I have been obsessed with it ever since. A few weeks ago, I heard your theater of the mind on your grief dream with your grandfather. I loved it, by the way. And I had the overwhelming feeling that I needed to reach out to you. I talked myself out of it. You probably get a million emails every day, so I don't want to bug you with mine. Then today, while listening to your show on grief dreams, I figured it was a sign to finally send you an email. Two years ago, my great-grandfather was dying. He was well into his 90s and had declining health problems for three to four years before this. Now, my great-grandpa was my hero. My whole life revolved around growing up to make him proud. Even when it came time to get married, I had to make sure my husband was someone just like him. Kind, caring, loving. I could go on. I had the wonderful opportunity to spend two years living near him and caring for him while his health failed. It wasn't until I moved back up north 
that his health really took a nasty turn. He became bedridden. I couldn't speak or or he couldn't speak or even use the restroom on his own. It's one of the hardest things to watch as a loved one starts to lose basic functions like that. Another thing with grandpa was he wasn't there. Like physically he was with us and his eyes were open. He would drift in and out of sleep, but mentally he was gone. He was responsive, but always seemed to be staring off into space. A lot of cool and paranormal things happened about this time. I'll save those for another day. Oh, you tease. What? I need to throw on a quick side note really quick. At this time in my life, my husband and I were trying for a baby. We had no luck, and I was getting increasingly depressed. Anyway, one night, I'm having a dream. I can recall Bill uh, bits and pieces of it, but nowhere, but out of nowhere, I'm pulled from that dream and into my great-grandpa's house. And not like how it normally is. In the living room, the couches were gone, and in their place was my great-grandpa's hospital bed. There was this little divider wall with aunts, that my aunts put up uh, when my grandpa needed to use the bathroom, and even the movable toilet in the corner of the room. I had only seen this house set up like this once, my last trip down to see him over a month ago. I just think that uh, if I'm going to dream about his house, I, I, I would dream about how I'm used to seeing it. Anyway, I'm in this room with my great-grandpa standing in front of me. There wasn't a long conversation or a heart-to-heart. All that happened was my grandpa pulled me into his arms and said to me, you're going to be a terrific mother. I woke up after he let me go, feeling so somber. I knew that was my last goodbye. He died about two weeks later. I don't think I've ever cried harder in my life than I did at his funeral. The man was the greatest person I knew. The world felt a little darker and a little colder now that he was gone. At the funeral of the grandkids and great-grandkids wrote him letters that we tucked into his casket so he could take them to heaven. In my letter, I jokingly said, send my kids down. I'm ready for them. One month later, I found out I was finally pregnant. I truly believe that God, or whatever higher power you want to call him, allowed me to become pregnant after his death. I had a month of grieving and bad depression, and I think this was the only thing that would have pulled me out of it. I didn't have the time to be depressed. I was too busy celebrating my pregnancy to sit and mope around. 2016 started off terrible with the death of my hero and ended with the birth of my beautiful daughter, making it the best year of my life, filling that cold, dark hole Grandpa had uh, taken with him and bringing beautiful warmth and light. I have theories about what happened when you die, and I could talk about that all day. I will say, I think our conscious or soul stays here on earth just past the veil. I think when grandpa would zone out or stare off into space, it was him focusing on learning how to move around like a spirit. I don't know how to explain it, but I think maybe he was stepping out of his body to move like astral projecting. Me and my grandpa, his daughter, and I have talked about this a lot, and we think maybe he was doing this to say goodbye to his family in in a way that he could. We have a very large family, and I haven't heard about anyone else having a dream about him, but literally hours before he died, my mom just knew to call him. He couldn't speak or even hold the phone up to his head, but his eyes lit up when he heard my mom's voice, and she got to say her last goodbyes to him. Maybe she felt his spirit saying goodbye to her and knew it was time to call. If you uh, made it this far, then thank you for taking the time to read this. Keep up the great work, Dave and Tim. I love what you guys do. Much love. That comes from Amanda. Well, Amanda, thank you very much for sharing that revealing and touching story. And yes, tell us the other paranormal stories, you jerk. Stop teasing us like that. (laughs) But that was a great story. Very touching. Thank you. Hello, Dave and Tim. I became a fan when you both were on Chris Jericho's podcast, and now I don't know how I would get through work without you guys. So thank you for all that you do. I've been wanting to write in for a while, but haven't found the time to do so until now. I have many stories, most of them creepy, one or two that were pants wettingly terrifying for me. But now I'm sending you this first email. I'll definitely send you more in the future if you both want me to. Well, what happens if I want you to and Tim doesn't? Yeah. Or what if you and I don't? Hmm. See, it's telling us, oh, I've got some great creepy stories. I've got these great pants wedding stories, but I'll just give you this one. It's like, I, I feel like we're dealing with a meth dealer here, Tim. Yeah, you <laughs> take the first one free. And if you like it and you want me back, <laughs> I'll be back with more stories. All right, well, let's see where this one goes. And then, Tim, you and I are going to weigh in on this. We never do this. We're going to weigh in on if we want more stories. All right. Are you ready? Ready. I just listened 
listened. I just listened <laughs> to the Joshua Black episode about the dream visitations. So I'm honoring uh, Sean Connery here, channeling him. I just listened to the Joshua Black episode about the dream visitations, and I really felt compelled to share this story with you. My grandmother passed away in October of, I believe, 2012. And we had been very close. She lived with my parents and I from the time I was born until I was five. Then when we moved her into an apartment, I continued to see her daily until I was well into my teens. My grandmother, unfortunately, had Huntington's disease, a neuromuscular and behavioral illness that made her paranoid, angry and violent. The more the illness progressed, as well as the worse the disease got, the less control over her movement that she had to the point where eventually she had to be in a wheelchair and she lost the ability to swallow uh, and talk this having to be on a feeding t- or thus having to be on a feeding tube. It was sad to watch my loving grandmother become another person over the years. And when she finally eventually passed, I was sad, of course. But at the same time, I was relieved that her suffering was finally over. OK, so now to the dream. Sorry for that background was so long, but I felt like I needed to set the stage for the impact that this dream had on me. So a couple months after she passed away, I have this dream that I only remember the end of. My cousin and I were running away from something. It felt evil. I can't remember what it looked like, but eventually we split up and I ran into a room and suddenly felt a very distinct change in what was happening. I was in my grandmother's room at the nursing home that she stayed in, and it was dark, but the air was thick and heavy. I remember realizing that I was dreaming before, and I still am, but this felt real. Then I saw her. I couldn't see her face. She was a black silhouette, but I knew it was my grandma. I felt the chill go up my spine because I was perfectly aware that my grandma was dead and she this was impossible. I couldn't even speak. I was so shocked. But I think she knew that because she spoke to me. She said, I love you. Everything's okay now. She said it so clearly, which she hadn't been able to really talk well in years. And it sounded just like I remembered her from my childhood. I felt another chill go up my spine when I woke up in a cold sweat. I told my mom that morning, and I remember her being very happy that my grandmother had come to see me. After all, out of all of her grandchildren, I was the one that she saw the most. And even though I already had believed she was at peace, she just wanted to let me know that she was free from the illness that plagued her through her life and that she was still thinking of me even in the afterlife. Thanks again for the hard work you guys do. And next time, I'll share a really spooky story. Sincerely, Nick from Ohio. All right, Tim, do we want to hear a scary story from Nick from Ohio? Yeah, I think so. I agree. Let's do it, Nick. Don't keep teasing us, man. Send on the stories. Dave at darknessradio.com. Hi, Dave and Tim. I'd like to share something that happened to my sister while growing up in a haunted house. One evening, my parents had friends over to the house. They were having a great time, loud laughing, talking, and carrying on. My sister was bored and asked our dad what she could do. Our dad told her to go into the basement and fix her little red wagon. It was something they had been working on. Excitedly, she went downstairs and walked back into the room where the tools and the wagon were. In the back of the room was yet another room. No other way to get in or out of the back room without going past my sister and her little red wagon. She was tinkering around with the wagon, all the while hearing the loud laughing and talking upstairs. All of a sudden, our dad walked out of the back room. He was two shades whiter than normal, and he had a big smile on his face. She was startled, and she could hear our dad talking upstairs. She was confused and scared, of course. As this ghostly dad spoke to her, he kept that big, eerie grin on his face. He told her to come with him into the back room he came out of. He was motioning for her to come with him, eerily smiling and talking at the same time. She was so frightened, she ran upstairs and hugged our dad and told him what just happened. So our dad and a friend of his ran into the basement. They were thinking an intruder was in the house, but there was no sign of anyone. They looked everywhere. He decided it was just my sister scaring herself while down there alone. Nothing more was done about it other than leaving a scar of fear inside my sister. Hope you enjoyed this parish share. That comes from Gene in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah, that's a creepy one, Gene. You got my hackles up. My, did you see him, Tim? I did. My hackles was up. Yep. Sorry about that. I should be hackle-free at this point in my <laughs> age, but I'm not. Gentlemen, that's how this one begins. Hmm. I'm a relatively new listener, perhaps about a year, but I love your Monday news parish air combination. It's lighthearted, but has substance, so I thought I'd share. My girlfriend and I went on a ramble through Canada and New England last summer. We decided to stay in Montreal for a few days and treated ourselves to a stay 
in the recently renovated Le Nouvel Hotel and Spa. We knew nothing about the hotel other than my credit points would work there. (laughs) That's the most important thing. The neighborhood has some older buildings, but it didn't strike me as historic. Montreal, though a wonderful place, one night we wandered through looking for dinner and ended up in a German restaurant. People talk about being treated like family, but I've never experienced it until here. We ate for two hours. We didn't drink anything, and we walked back to the hotel filled to the brim with meat and potatoes. Sign me up, Tim. Oh, yeah. Now, I have to describe the hotel room. It was pretty standard. When you walked in through the electronically locked door, immediately to the right was the bathroom door. On the left, further into the room, was a full-length seven-foot or so mirror, then the TV, then a desk, then the far wall. Past the bathroom, on the right, the room opened up into a king bed and a pair of comfy chairs. The TV was directly across from the bed. After our embarrassingly filling meal, both of us went into the relaxation mode. I fell onto the bed to watch TV, and my girlfriend was sitting in a chair to my right. From my field of view, I could clearly see the bathroom door through the full-length mirror. After 45 minutes or an hour of relaxing watching TV, I saw with certain clarity the back of a person walk into the bathroom through the mirror. They were wearing black with a white collar, not unlike a cliché maid outfit. So certain, in, so certain, in fact, I immediately assumed that the hotel had accidentally given housekeeping directions to replace something in our bathroom or that housekeeping used their master key to get into the wrong room to work on something or even that our key got duplicated and the person who just walked into the wrong room needed to take an emergency bathroom break and didn't realize somebody was already in the room. It's not unheard of for the hotel to accidentally issue an incorrect electronic key code. I got up and walked over in my boxers to talk to the person and try to figure out what happened, but nobody was in the bathroom. I turned the lights on and even checked behind the shower curtain. Nothing. As I walk back out, I look at the door. The backup lock, a standard hotel U-bolt lock, was engaged. There's no way somebody walked in. At this point, nothing was bothering me. I assumed I was having a German gluttony hallucination (laughs) and walked back out. My girlfriend gave me a puzzled look. I don't know. I must be going crazy or I'm tired. I I just saw somebody walk into that bathroom through the mirror, but there's nobody there. She stared at me for a second and said, I saw too. She had a different angle and could not see the bathroom reflection in the mirror. I saw something black move out of the corner of my eye close to the ground. I thought it was a big black dog, which makes me crazy too. We locked eyes for a minute. I got up and looked around. I thought perhaps it was shadows from car lights, but we were too high up. I thought perhaps I might have been a shadow from a sudden burst of light from the building across from us, but there was no way it could generate that kind of shadow. The angle from the mirror to the window was such that only a pers- uh, only open sky could have reflected in, in, in this nighttime. There was not a single item of black in the bathroom. The bathroom lights were off, so it couldn't have been a light or a flicker. We, we didn't have an earthquake. I thought perhaps somebody in the other room had fallen against the wall and caused the mirror to move. The mirror was screwed into the wall on all four corners and in the middle. I then thought perhaps that a rat or something was in the room, but this was clearly a person's reflection of at least five feet tall. I spent an hour investigating angles and running hypotheses as if I were on the Warren Commission. Nothing to this day. I've got nothing. I don't know what we saw, but we both saw it. I'm not ready to say I saw a ghost, but between us and the millions of listeners, we slept with the lights on that night and the next night. Thanks for a great show. Best, and that comes from Wes in Virginia. Thank you, Wes in Virginia. It's a good creepy story. How'd you feel, Tim? You're so bloated on German fare and cuisine, and a ghost pops into your room, head into the head. I can't. That's stop. not the place you want to be, right? Because if you're loaded with uh, brats and sauerkraut, I don't think a ghost should be trying to hang out in your bathroom. No, they're going to get blasted. That's just will, all there's to I will, it. I will cleanse thee in moments. <laughs> All right. Um, When my brother was dying of AIDS, this is how this email begins. When my brother was dying of AIDS in the early 90s, he told me he wasn't afraid. In fact, he was excited about the new adventure. Just think, he said, I'll be the first one of us to find out what really is out there on the other side of this life. He also said if he could, he'd communicate with me from Summerland and tell me what it was like. After he died, as often happens during a traumatic experience, life stepped in and gave me a dozen Other huge things to deal with so I could process my loss later, after it wasn't so raw. 
Work took me off to another country for months, and I left his ashes in a plain cardboard box in the bottom drawer in my bedroom. Months later, I was home again in my room behind locked doors, sitting in my favorite meditation chair, holding his ashes in my lap with both hands out of the box, just in plain, clear plastic bag. Well, I said, I'm I'm here, and you're somewhere else. If you can talk to me, I'm listening. Is there life after death? What's going on? Where are you? After a minute or two, the ashes started pulsating like a beating heart would. My hands were still around them. I was frozen. For a few moments, it scared the crap out of me until I realized he had answered my questions. Yes, there is life after death. The only beat for a little while, then it stopped. I put them back in the drawer, bottom uh, bottom drawer, and went on with my life, content that he was okay and I was going to be okay too. A few days or weeks, I can't remember exactly, he did come and talk to me. I awoke one night in my bed, and there he was sitting across the room in my chair. He told me he was uh, life was great where he was. He was so happy. He had a great job and lots of other things. And I should wait. Hold on. What the f- A job? Tim? Yeah. to go on to the great beyond, and get, we're going to have to work again? Uh, I don't want to go. A biscuit. What? Yeah. Oh, my God. He was so happy he had a great job and lots of other things. I should not worry one bit. Well, now I'm even more worried about death than I was before, Tim. I've worked pretty hard not to have a job the last 12 years. <laughs> I want to go there and have to have a job all over. What's it going to be like? Hello and welcome. You're listening to the best in paranormal, well, normal talk radio. This is... Beyond the darkness into the light with your ghostly host, Dave Schrader, and his equally menacing ghostly host, Tim Dennis. I think we're going to be doing radio on the other side, Tim, broadcasting over to this side, trying to communicate through EVP. Maybe. Digress. Let's get back into this person's story. When I tried to ask him a question, he said, I can't stay and I can't answer questions. You have to follow your own path, but I'll always be here. Time doesn't exist where I am, so you take your own time and I'll watch what happens. I'm paraphrasing, of course. That was a long time ago, and I don't remember his words exactly, but then he disappeared. There are a lot of people in my life who have passed to the other side, and they all come back and help me out. Hardly a day goes by that I don't find myself saying thank you, thank you, when one of them finds my keys or stops me from getting hurt uh, myself or providing an answer I need. Don't let anyone tell you all ghosts are evil entities. It's not true. Ghosts are like people. Some are good and some are bad. And that comes from Cher. No, not the Cher, Tim. Oh. She's much too. uh. Oh. And besides, she wouldn't be talking to us because she's working on turn back time. So there's a job on the other side. Tim? Yeah. Jobs? Other side jobs, Tim? Yeah, I didn't sign up for that. Damn. I don't want to (laughs) go. Nope. Good morning, Dave and Tim. I'm a longtime fan of The Unknown, and when I found Coast to Coast AM when art was on, I was hooked and have been ever since. Thanks for all you folks do. I have had two notable strange occurrences thus far in my life. I've explained both as follows. My first strange encounter goes back to the time when the Waltons TV program was first airing. It must have been the early 80s. I was in my late teens, early 20s as my dad was alive and well and watching the show with me in their front living room. He died in 1988 from a very rare form of salivary cancer. So that's how I know the decade. It was approximately 9.30 p.m. or so, pitch blackout, when suddenly we noticed an eerie yellow glow coming from the windows on all sides of our house. My mom, who was in another room, came running out and in a panic asked us what was going on. My dad and I, as confused and scared as she, approached the front door, which faces east, and once opened, we were witness to the entire outdoors being cloaked in this eerie yellow and uh, eerie yellow uh, eerie yellow. What, where does this go? And the maple tree. There we go. Sorry, the uh, sentence just jumped out of my out of my skull here. Uh, <laughs> the uh, we were witness to the entire outdoors being cloaked in this eerie yellow, and the maple tree in our front yard even looked much more pronounced in color, darker than on an average evening. We opened the front door. My dad stepped out on the front step 
and looked to the sky, but no sound or presence or anything could be seen nor heard. It was extremely quiet. No sounds, natural or otherwise, could be heard. We returned inside, and after a few minutes, just as quickly as it had come, it left, and the darkness returned to normal. The interesting thing is we were watching our local news at 11 p.m. that night, and their top story was about this event. However, they reported that a UFO had been sighted by several people flying over Atsiko Lake, a small lake not far from us, and was seen heading east. My dad, now 62 years old, I still hear his words spoken immediately hearing this. We were in the direct path of whatever that thing was. Needless to say... I have always been intrigued by this encounter, and despite searching the night sky over the years, have never had such an experience since. However, it has definitely piqued my interest in UFOs and all things un- unknown. My second story, on another note, my youngest brother, Danny, back in 1975, was a patient at Babies Hospital, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in Manhattan, as he was born in 1960 with Down syndrome and congestive heart disease. At age 15, he underwent open heart surgery and complications arose during surgery, but amazingly, he made it through the surgery. My mom and I, who in 1918 was born with a veil, which is a skin covering her entire face and lived with psychic abilities her entire life, we were escorted by a nurse to a recovery room to see my brother after his surgery. The nurse, however, told us that the recovery room was not accessible via elevator, but instead was accessible only via a ladder. While we both thought that this was strange, but regardless, we didn't care. We just wanted to see my little brother. We followed her to the metal ladder, adhered close to the wall, climbed up, single file, and entered a room, which I can still see to this day. When we came up upon five beds with young children in each Three beds were on the left, two beds were on the right, and she led us to my brother, who was asleep, but came up and giving us both a kiss in return. The nurse then approached us and gently led us back down the ladder. When we told our family later about climbing the ladder, they all told us that was impossible. My sister and RN was totally in denial about what we were sharing, so at our earliest opportunity... We asked the doctor about their unconventional recovery room, and he seemed shocked and told us that they don't have such a room. Mom and I were offended, uh, spoke of of our experience and reassured each other that uh, despite what others thought on the subject, what we had seen was true. Mom passed away at a home at the age of 90 in 2009. My brother, Dan, my best buddy, you see, died in 1975 at age 15 after our visit and exchange of kisses. When I hear the song Stairway to Heaven, I immediately go back to our experience and wonder if it was God's way of gently preparing us for passing, as my mom and I think we did just that. I just retired from being a licensed, certified social worker in New York State, and I found my personal experiences to be helpful in relating to people who would come to me for therapy, who would discuss their unusual experiences, which, because of their uniqueness, was causing them depression and or anxiety as a result. Interesting how these experiences have been a positive force in my life, and I thank God every day. That's from Joyce Becker. Thank you for uh, writing in, Joyce. I feel like I read that on one of the dream story casts, Hmm. but uh, it was an interesting story I thought I'd read again. Wouldn't you question it, Tim? If you went to the hospital, and having been to as many hospitals as we've both been to, if they said, you can see Dave, but come in, we got to take you in through this uh, back route, and you got to climb this ladder up into the room above, wouldn't that send off a whole bunch of red flags to you? Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't... uh, Thanks for getting so in-depth in that answer. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, it. it uh, I, I would question immediately. <laughs> yeah, that seems weird. Uh, all right, our final story. Dave and Tim, I grew up in a small neighborhood which consisted of two streets in the shape of a U with an alley between and a main road crossing the top of the U. So it was enclosed for the most part. There were plenty of kids all around the same age, which provided plenty of people to play with at any given time of day. Since this was before the age of computers, smartphones, and 2,000 channels to watch, we kept busy with kickball, capture the flag, baseball, basketball, tag football, etc. We were always into something outdoors and always in a group of at least four. On my side of the U, about five houses down, there was an elderly woman who lived alone. She was probably in her 70s, but being a little kid, it was hard to judge that. Older than my parents, but not as old as my great aunt, kind of old. Anyway, she loved to have us kids around. The more, the better for her. We would spend hours there, playing, reading, eating treats that she would make for us, just being kids. Things were different then. And in a neighborhood like ours, everyone knew each other. And there was a sense of safety, whether perceived or actual. Something that I remember vividly about our visits 
there that stuck out with me all these years were the seances and the Ouija board sessions. Picture four to six children ranging in age from six to ten sitting at a round table by candlelight holding hands trying to summon the dead. Weird, right? I hadn't thought about it until I heard some of the stories on Darkness Radio that triggered the memory of this bizarre scenario. I mean, this woman had blackout curtains and everything. I believe we actually had that table moving around on more than one occasion, too. Of course, I can't be sure it wasn't one of the older children trying to freak us out, but I distinctly remember that it was moving. Candles would flicker uncontrollably, knocks on the wall, the whole nine yards. I don't remember if we were asking or just anyone. She gave out specific names, but looking back, the whole thing was very bizarre. Coincidentally, around the same time, I woke up one morning in the corner of my room with odd memories of being lift, lifted or dragged from my bed. Maybe I brought something home that day. Even if, in the end, it was all for amusement of a lonely old lady, I feel like I've become open to the paranormal. I believe anyone who ever went in there was affected in some way, whether spiritual or paranormal. We all took something away from it. Thank you. And that comes from Scott. Well, thank you, Scott. Very cool story. That's it for this week's Paranormal Parish Air and Supernatural News. We'll be back again next Monday with more. So send us your stories. And if you've stumbled upon some interesting supernatural news stories that we may miss, email them to us at dave at darknessradio.com. And we want to hear your paranormal encounters, whether they're funny, scary, loving, charming, weird, bizarre. We want to hear them all. You can email me, dave at darknessradio.com. And the more succinct and descriptive you are, there's a good chance it may end up on one of our Friday episodes as a theater of the mind, as we often do. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you for joining us and spending your time with us. And remember, if you're looking for some cool swag, paranormal paraphernalia for the holidays, go check out darknessradio.com and click on our Killer Deals link. It'll take you into our Amazon page that shows all of the cool books that you hear us talk about on the show. Plus, there's clothing, ghost hunting, and Bigfoot hunting tools, and more. And every time you use that link and then go purchase other items for Amazon, a small portion of that sale goes a long way to to help your buddies right here on Beyond the Darkness with our uh, streaming costs and administrative costs. So do what you can. Go in there, order all your items for Amazon using that link, bookmark it, and use it, and it goes a long way to help out your buddies here. Thanks again. Be kind. Love one another. We'll be back tomorrow with more Beyond the Darkness and True Crime Tuesday. Tuesday.